Good morning. Welcome to the adult Bible class. We are um, continuing week 22 of our church history course. Uh, we're going to be taking a look today uh, at Jerome and the Latin Vulgate Bible and what difference that makes to us uh, in church history. Uh, just pulling out, uh, uh, let's see, I got, I got ahead of myself. That's next week, Augustine of Hippo. Uh, that's not where we're at. So here we are um, in church history. We have covered why it's important to study church history. We've looked at the early church, and we saw the changes that happened in the early church, especially changes to the structure or governance of the church, uh, the spread of the gospel, and how that uh, was impacted and collided with the philosophical structures of their time and how those kind of affected the way that they spoke about the gospel and the way that they understood the word of God, uh, especially uh, the differences that arose between the eastern part of the church uh, and the western part of the church. And then we proceeded to look at what happened when persecution of the church kind of subsided. And we're going to look at that in review again right at the beginning of this course. Um, and so here we are. We, we have rewound from the Council of uh, Chalcedon in 451. And we've gone back into the 4th century, uh, mid-4th century, 300s. We took a look at Ambrose of Milan and we saw how he, uh, as Bishop of Milan, stood up against the empire, against the emperor in particular, uh, and asserted the authority of the church, uh, even over the state, and, and really uh, mixed the spheres. So uh, we'll pray. I'll talk about the uh, resources that I recommend that you take a look at for um, further study of this topic, and we'll get into today's lesson. Father, I thank you that uh, the record of how you have moved in history has not been lost I thank you that, that we understand that, that what we understand of Scripture today is not new or unique uh, or invented by our culture, but goes all the way back to uh, the earliest Christians. Father, I ask that uh, our study of this uh, would enrich our love for you, would enrich our understanding of how we read Scripture, would uh, enrich the way we understand our tradition has uh, oftentimes affected the way we see Scripture. And Lord, that we would uh, peel that back and, 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 and pursue uh, worship of you and pursue uh, an understanding of your word as, as you intended to give it to that uh, first audience and apply that in our life today, in our situation. Uh, and I ask that this study would uh, just grow us all um, in that sense. In your name I pray. Amen. All right. Um, so David... Ewert, um, this was the 1990 book. I understand there is a revision to this uh, that is out there, but this uh, is an excellent resource um, to give you a, a very quick uh, overview, not too scholastic or heavy read, uh, about how we got to English translations of the Bible today, uh, what, what happened as we went through there. Uh, Tony Lane, in A Concise History of Christian Thought, has uh, three pages about Jerome and what he understood. Jerome, uh, we might say, was the first <sighs> scholar um, outside of origin uh, who really um, concentrated Western thinking into the church, who really uh, kind of uh, pushed aside um, Eastern influence and really um, push that Western way of thinking, the, the way that we understand Scripture, honestly, uh, into Scripture. Uh, Lorena Lopez, uh, he is teaching at the, uh, begins with an A, Baptist Bible Institute, and I can't remember, um, <laughs> I should have written it into my um, Citation. Anyhow, you can find his teaching on YouTube. I put the link right there. Um, and he does an excellent three-part series about the introduction also to the Bible. Um, Stefan Rebenick, this is more of the academic resource. If you, um, you, you know, have trouble sleeping, uh, 
Uh, this is the book you're going to want to open up and, and study. Uh, this is a very Roman Catholic resource. If you want to understand the way your Roman Catholic friends think about the Bible and think about the authority of the church, listen to his um, teaching. I, again, if you don't come out of here thinking that's not right or I need to, you know, I'm not doing my job. This is the adult thinking Bible class, right? We are trying to encourage you, giving you resources from uh, many sides. And James White is a Reformed Baptist. He gave this lecture at uh, Phoenix Reformed Seminary. Uh, and it is just an audio podcast. So uh, he tends to be a storyteller. So it uh, takes a while to get the information out of him, but eventually it does come. So we have six things we're going to try to get through today, uh, a review uh, so that we can put Jerome in his context. We understand who he was based on where he was in, in history and geography. Uh, we'll give a brief biography of the man. Uh, we'll take a, a quick tour of the old Latin translations, which is important because without understanding what was happening to scripture in Latin, uh, we won't know why there was a need for the Latin Vulgate. Uh, then we'll talk about really one of the major things is uh, Jerome gave the foundation for the Protestant Reformation to assert that these apocryphal books, these, these additions to Scripture are not inspired words from God. Uh, and we go all the way back to Jerome's discussion as Protestants, uh, whereas the Roman Catholic Church who accepts the Apocrypha as deuterocanonical, secondary canon, um, you know, why, why that difference is there. So it's helpful for us to be able to put ourselves in history and see, you know, what was going on in the Western church that between Jerome uh, and the Bishop of Rome uh, to understand. And then what can we learn from Ambrose and Jerome for today? Why does it matter? So good morning. You had a late start to the day as I did. So um, when just a quick review. We, we remember that Christianity began in Jerusalem, right? It started uh, in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes down on these apostles. They were promised by God to be uh, reminded of all truth and, and that they were going to go from Jerusalem and, and, and beyond and spread the word of God. And that's exactly what happened. That's the record Luke gives us uh, in the book of Acts. And originally it started as sort of a Jewish movement. They spread into the synagogues and, and spoke in the synagogues of the Old Testament prophesying of the Messiah and how Christ, Jesus himself, was that Christ. But increasingly, uh, it began to be identified as its own movement. They worshiped on Sunday, not on the Sabbath day on Saturday. Uh, they, they didn't participate in a lot of the sacrificial offerings uh, Judaism was legal under Roman rule because it was an ancient, respected religion, but Christianity was this new thing. And as, as the Christians um, really identified themselves uniquely, the Jews helped them with that because they wanted the Christians to be persecuted. They wanted the Romans to understand these people are not of us. Don't give them the protections uh, we have. And so um, initially this persecution of Christians was sporadic. It was the local governor here or the proconsul there. But eventually we get to really in the early 4th century uh, under Diocletian, empire-wide formal persecution of Christians. Uh, and, and this was very intense. And, and because of this persecution, we saw that uh, the churches themselves began to kind of form themselves governmentally as the Roman Empire. There were people who were identified as, as more significant in the church body uh, so that if the Roman government were to persecute or, or make a pariah out of somebody, they would make a pariah out of the leader. They, they began to have this kind of rise of the bishops. Uh, and that, that had to happen, really, uh, because as the apostles died off and people uh, didn't yet have formalized which are the inspired words of God and which one are just letters written, you know, by Clement over to the church in Corinth from Rome, you know, First Clement, is that inspired? Is the Didache, is that inspired? Uh, they, they didn't have that understanding yet. They hadn't yet come to recognize uh, 
Uh, so the Roman government is persecuting the churches and they want to say, okay, I'm going to take your most important person, send them to the uh, lions to you know, be sacrificed or, or uh, killed. And, and that would make their followers then not want to follow Christianity. But of course, it had the exact opposite effect. It also caused the spread of scripture uh, to be uh, really uncontrolled and, and rampant when we did our study through how we got the Bible, the, the doctrine of the Bible itself, we saw that the Old Testament was inside of a religious and government structure. The nation of Israel um, itself had a priestly class. But the Christians were not influential in the government, so as they're spreading illegally the word of God, they're often hastily making handwritten copies of those. Uh, and, and so the, the spread of Scripture had to happen kind of in an underground um, sort of homebrewed uh, fashion. It also caused them to deal with what do we do with Christians who, who uh, turn away from their faith, at least publicly, under persecution? What happens when, when uh, the, they denounce their faith? How do you receive someone like that back? And we saw that, in fact, it was the people who had been most uh, impacted by the, who stood firm in their faith, most impacted, most tortured, most um, violently treated. They were the most open to receiving people back into the faith who, had, con, who had, had publicly confessed they weren't Christians to escape the torture. But the people who had never experienced that were the hardliners and the ones who, who did not want to receive them back, such as the Donatists. Uh, that controversy is going to be very important next week as we look at Augustine. So in 311, we saw Constantine who um, came down from the Britain area where he was pronounced Caesar and fought against Maxentius at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. He was a Christian, claimed to be a Christian. Anyhow, I can't attest to the truth of that. Uh, and, and because of his uh, Christianity, all of a sudden he wanted it to be legal for you to be a Christian. And in 313 AD, he convinced the Eastern emperor to agree with him that they should no longer make Christianity an illegal religion. It was called the Edict of Milan. Frequently, this is um, wrongly portrayed in histories as making Christianity the legal or the formal religion of the Roman Empire. That did not happen until 381 under Theodosius I. So in 313, it was simply no longer illegal to be a Christian, and the church got to change its focus from not being persecuted and dying to now digging into kind of these heavier uh, theological topics. And this, this uh, doctrinal development is going to happen in two different tracks based on Primarily the language that is spoken. In the West, they spoke Latin. Latin is a very precise language. They can speak about the substance of something separate from the person of something. But in the Greek language, those words are synonyms. And so we saw the doctrine of the Trinity very much more in the West, uh, already a settled matter because of Tertullian, 150 years before this explodes into these church councils in the East. So uh, the, the natural uh, pattern that this followed was first, is Jesus really God? Is, is God three persons in one being? We all know the, you know, Shema Yisrael, right? The, uh, uh, the Lord your God is one, right? Deuteronomy uh, speaks of this. This is the daily um, assertion that the Jews would make about one God. And as Christians, we believe in one God who is one in being, but three in persons. And then we, we look at that and we say, okay, well, if Jesus is God, how can he also be human? What's the nature of that union? That's kind of the next uh, natural thought progress. And this is what we saw happening in these church councils. And what about the spirit of God? Is, is he God also? Is he personal? Um, and so uh, in the East, these are happening. And in the West, we saw that the, the Roman Empire moved its capital out of Rome over to Constantinople. Now, Rome had claimed for itself to be an important patriarchy, okay, an important church uh, center. So did Antioch. So did Alexandria. 
So did Constantinople, and so did Jerusalem. At first, it started out that way because they said, we are a church that was founded by an apostle. Jerusalem was the first church that Peter was uh, kind of the head of. At least this is the, the, the claim that's made. Uh, and then Rome, although biblically we have no evidence that Peter ever went to Rome, uh, we do have church history kind of traditions that say that. And the Roman bishop would claim for himself that he was taking over after Peter and that this was a continuous line. At Antioch and Alexandria claim Mark as their founding apostle. Constantinople, we saw, said, well, we're the new Rome. So if Rome is a patriarch, we're the new Rome. We are one also. Eventually, they changed that argument from being a government-based argument to saying, well, Andrew, the brother of Peter, was our founding, and we're the sister of Rome. So it's kind of this um, clever way of, of claiming authority for themselves. So we, we have these five cities that claim popes as their head. Pope is just derived from the word papa, father, patriarch, um, but in the West, Rome stands alone. There's no government authority there, and they don't have anybody else who is a major see that speaks Latin in their area. And so they have this kind of unique development in history where they, they sort of understood themselves as being more important, and they were actually appealed to, we saw in several of the councils, theologically. We saw Leo's tome and the important role, for example, that that played at the Council of Chalcedon. We saw that uh, the Bishop of Rome was appealed to by Cyprian, for example, in 381 at the Council of Constantinople for theological purpose. So um, in 339 to 397, uh, we saw that Ambrose of Milan asserted his authority as a bishop in a way that um, stood over the government and actually uh, directed and shaped the government. And so this is where we're at in history. Uh, Jerome is born around 340 AD. Some go all the way back to the 330s. Some say it's in the later 340s. We're not exactly certain about uh, when he was exactly born. His biographer gives a different record than he gives himself. Uh, he was born, and, and the records are consistent, in a place called Striden. Uh, you may recognize the boot of Italy here and Greece. Uh, this is Striden right here. Okay, so uh, why is that significant? Well, here's Milan. That was the Roman capital. Here's Trier. That was another Roman capital. Remember, Diocletian had four main leaders of the, the uh, empire, two Augustuses. Augustums, Augusti, uh, and two Caesars, right? The junior guys were the Caesars. And so they got Trier, and they got Thessalonica, and the Caesars got Milan and Constantinople right here. Milan, Constantinople. So, so he was born kind of right in the center, but he was born at an unfortunate time because in 340 AD, um, Julian the Apostate was ruling over the western part of the empire. And one of the things he had done was made it illegal for Christians to receive higher education. So, uh, you know, when, when we talked about Julian, we understood that, that people today who say pastors and theologians should not get higher education, they're in agreement with Julian the apostate. They're playing according to the same sheet of music that this apostate who sought to destroy Christianity played along with. So he couldn't get a good education until Julian died. And the minute Julian died, like literally that same year, his parents sent him, Jerome, to Rome. I'm a poet. I didn't even know it. To get a, a classical education. Not, not a theological education, but a classical education. Grammar uh, and rhetoric. And Jerome lived a typical secular student Life. So imagine somebody at the University of Southern California who's got no um, Christian spirit to them. Well, the things they're into and the things they're doing are the things Jerome was doing. But Jerome was plagued by this. His parents were Christian, so he had this kind of continual sense of guilt. And so at night, his, he would go to the catacombs where the Christians were gathering uh, had been gathering to worship when they were being persecuted. 
And he would look at the bones of the Christians that were buried in the catacombs and try to imagine himself dead and in hell and, and being you know, tortured for eternity for his sins. So he, he had this um, very impassioned uh, conviction about him, even though during you know, the daytime he was living in a tip, typical secular student life. So uh, he also was a vigorous... Um, uh, he, he enjoyed very much the classics, right? The, the, the classic uh, Latin literature. Uh, he, he said he had a dream one time uh, that he, he had gone up into heaven and was standing before God and God said, uh, who are you and, or what are you? And he said, uh, he responded to God, I'm a Christian. And God responded to him, no, you're a, um, I can't remember the classic Latin author, that uh, God convinced him of being. But he said, no, you're, you're really following this classic Latin author. And he sentenced him to be tortured by the angels. And Jerome pleaded for mercy. And, and, and Jerome woke up and he said when he woke up, he had welts on his back. You, you know, this, uh, this, this moment for him convinced him to, to swear off his um, classical literature love. And, and, and to be fair, when you and I want to build a library, what do we do? We either go on Amazon or christianbook.com or go to a bookstore. For Jerome, he had to hand copy the books that he wanted in his library. So this was, you know, the, the investment to him to build his library was significantly different uh, than for us. So about 30 years old, uh, he becomes a Christian, he gets baptized, and he wants to live a life that is free of the temptations of, of his classical literature, of the good food he has in Rome, of the, the women that he had been with in Rome. So what's he do? He moves to the desert and he commits to learning Hebrew, which having studied Hebrew, I can tell you, uh, that will dry you up <laughs> spiritually, emotionally, uh, mentally. It is a very difficult language for me. I, I could never get the flow, the rhythm of Hebrew. Like it's got a whole um, kind of rhythm to it that, that I just never could do. But he spent three years out in the desert learning Hebrew. Um, and this was in Antioch. So remember, he's a Western classically trained, philosophically person, learned theology after he became a Christian in the West and then moved to the East where he's now learning Hebrew. So he's in this really unique position as a kind of a um, Westerner who is living in the East. And he's learning Hebrew actually from converted Jewish Christians and so he's, he's going straight to the source, and he spends three years there. He gets uh, ordained as a presbyter, which in English we abbreviate presbyter to the word priest. Biblically, presbyter, episkopos, um, pastor, those are all the same word. They have the same functions. Uh, it was early church history that elevated the bishop, the episkopos, above the presbyter, the priest. So at this time, the priest was kind of the, the guy who did the work of uh, preaching and, and um, ministering to people. So he was at the lowest rung, but he was still clergy, not laity. But he, he had permission to not serve as a priest because he wanted to continue to study uh, his theology and, and learn. Uh, well, in 382, the Bishop of Rome, a guy named Damasus, recalls him to Rome because they're going to have a synod uh, this is the historical record that uh, we have. Um, now, Jerome had been charged uh, under Damasus with sorting out the fact that the Latin translations of the Bible that had been kind of spreading around uh, outside of any kind of control of the church uh, because they were being persecuted. There was no central organization. There was nobody that could say, hey, you've made a mistake here. Correct your translation. And so they had quite a few uh, differing translations that existed in the Latin, and we'll take a look at that. And Damasus said, if we're going to, you know, understand theology correctly, we should probably have the right words in the Bible, right? That's a pretty fair thing to expect, right? Let's, let's try to get to the, the words that, you know, Paul said or John said, for example. 
Well, by 384, he had produced a version of the Gospels and the Psalms in Latin, but they were not well received publicly. In fact, um, I don't know if I put this in here, but um, he had, he had uh, later translated Jonah. I'm sure I have it in here. I'm not going to tell that story yet. Well, 384, Damasus dies. And Jerome is a very acerbic, uh, irritating, um, angry man. Uh, one of his best friends, a guy named uh, Rufinus, who had been a close friend of uh, Jerome's, as long as Jerome was in agreement with Origen, Rufinus was his friend, but Jerome came to understand that Origen had gotten some things wrong, and so he began to write really nasty letters to his friend, Rufinus, saying he's short, he's fat, he's a two-legged donkey, right? He didn't use the word donkey, right? Like, th these are the things he's writing to his friend in public letters that everybody's reading, right? So uh, in 384, when Damasus dies, um, although Jerome wanted to become the new bishop of Rome, nobody thought he should be, and so he did not get to be. So he has to move to Bethlehem. Now, some of his best followers, his strongest supporters, were actually uh, widowed uh, women. He was a strong supporter also of virginity. Remember we saw with Ambrose that women didn't let their daughters go hear Ambrose preach because he was such a strong proponent of uh, virginity that they were afraid they'd never have any grandkids if their daughters listened to Ambrose speak. Well, J J Jerome cut from the same cloth. He also is a, a strong uh, proponent of the perpetual virginity of Mary, that she never really did marry uh, uh, Joseph, for example, that you know, they had this platonic sort of relationship. Well, Jerome uh, moves to Bethlehem. He moves to Bethlehem with uh, Paula and her daughter, who were his strongest supporters. They formed three convents. He formed a monastery. He was the head of the monastery. And he continued to work on his uh, Latin translation of the Bible that Damasus had set him on. So right now we've got the four Gospels and Psalms, 384, Jerome's in Bethlehem. And what's the source material he's working with? Well, what he's working with are these uh, old Latin versions. If you do any kind of uh, textual criticism study, you'll see them referred to as uh, VL, vet Old Latin, um, or Old Italian. Um, so these are old, these are copies before Jerome's Latin Vulgate, um, of the Bible in Latin. And we, we don't have a whole lot of these compared to the versions of the Latin Vulgate after Jerome. So they're, they're kind of few and far between. Uh, and a few of them are, are, are notable for different reasons. And I just want to give you an idea of the examples of old Latin translations of the Bible before Jerome and what was in them. Codex. Versalensis is the oldest copy we have of the Gospels in Latin. Uh, it, it is missing the last four pages, though. And in the Western Bibles, they didn't go uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They actually put them Matthew, John, Luke, and Mark. And so what happens when you lose the last four pages of the Bible, uh, you may know that Mark chapter 16, verses uh, 9 through 20, are questioned are, are those original to Mark? Were those added later? Well, it would be nice to know if our oldest copy of the Latin Bible had those verses in Mark, right? Well, sadly, those four pages are lost. But we know there isn't enough room to put them in there. There is one page that was added, so it doesn't appear to have it. Now, what's interesting is that um, this is the footnote about Mark 16 verses 9 through 20 out of the uh, United Bible Society's uh, fifth version. So uh, here at verse 8, they say omit verses 9 through 20, and they give you all these different um, records. And so interestingly, Jerome says those are not original to the Greek language. But you come down here, everywhere you see these double slashes, that's a, a difference. Uh, 
So some add a shorter ending only. Some add the shorter ending and the long ending. Some add the long ending with a footnote. Others just add the long ending as if they were original. So Jerome says they're not original, but then you come down here to, uh, you know, where is it added, and you see that little VG? That's Jerome's Latin Bible, the Vulgate. So he says they're not original, but when he makes the translation of the Bible, he puts it in there without a critical note. So what do you make of Jerome, right? He's, he's of two minds, evidently. Uh, and it's not only that, but like you see this, Eusebius, uh, manuscripts assorting according to Eusebius. Well, Eusebius also has commentary on those, even though he says they're not original. So why does he provide commentary to them? So it, it, is, it is tricky business sorting out uh, those textual critical details. Uh, but that's why that particular copy is, is significant. Uh, Codex Colbertinus. I don't know why I put an exclamation mark right there. Uh, it's from the 12th century. It has the Gospels and Acts in the Old Latin but the remainder of it, it has the, the Vulgate, according to the way uh, Jerome. It's interesting because it actually names the two thieves that are, or the robbers or barbarians that are hanging with Jesus on the cross. Um, evidently, they're Zoatham. Uh, and Matthew and Mark both have this record. And in uh, the Old Latin, Matthew and Mark give different names. I mean, they're the same name. It's just one is a little bit longer. That's actually one of the characteristics of these old Latin Bibles is if there's a, a short way of saying something and a long way of saying something, they almost always use the long way of saying it. So Codex Gigas is a 13th century um, monastic Bible. It is uh, illuminated, which means it's, it's got a lot of art in it. Um, it's about 165 pounds, 36 inches long, 20 inches wide closed, uh, and 8.7 inches thick. So the story about it's actually interesting in that there was a monk who had broken his vow, and his punishment was to be walled up in his chamber alive and just either starve or dehydrate to death. And so he says, I will produce in one night a book worthy of God to atone for my sin. And, and this is purported to be uh, the book that he produced. But he did so, as the legend says, not by praying to God and asking for his help, but rather by turning and selling his soul to the devil, which we know is stupid because before you're saved, the devil already owns your soul. You can't sell him what he owns, right? Um, so uh, this Bible is known sometimes as the devil's Bible because it has this enormous uh, colored blue devil. So if you've thought the oldest, you know, pictures of the devil were of a red um, like lizard man with a pitchfork and horns and a tail. Nope, he's a blue troll looking dude with whole uh, horns. Um, that, that is the oldest drawing we have of somebody imagining Satan. And again, it comes from an old Latin version of the Bible. Codex uh, Babiensis is from the 4th or 5th century. Um, the only known versions we have this is, is the short ending of Mark. Quote, but they reported briefly to Peter and those with him all that they had been told, and after this, Jesus himself appeared to them and sent out by means of them from east to west the sacred and perishable proclamation of eternal salvation. So this old Latin Bible has an ending of Mark that is not in any Bible that we have today, and that's from um, right, right at the end of the uh, 300s into the 400s. Uh, so it's got this short ending. It also, though, names two Roman gods, Helios and Jupiter, which is interesting. Um, many scholars think that the guy who uh, copied this couldn't even read or speak Latin. He was just copying character by character, and he knew a few Latin things, like you and I know a few uh, Hebrew words, right? The Hebrew word for woe is oi, right? The, the Hebrew word for Christ is Messiah, right? The, the Hebrew word for worship God is hallelujah, Right, so in the same way, he knew a few Latin words, but didn't really speak or read Latin. They, they don't think he could read at all, but he did copy it. All right, so he was assigned by Damasus in 382 uh, to make a new Latin copy that would correct all the uh, errors that had crept into uh, the old Latin versions and come up with an authorized version 
of the Bible. And writing to his pope, he had this to say about this task. He said, you urge me to revise the old Latin version and, as it were, to sit in judgment on the copies of the scriptures which are now scattered throughout the world. And inasmuch as they differ from one another, you would have me decide which of them agree with the Greek original. The labor is one of love, but at the same time both perilous and presumptuous. For in judging others, I must be content to be judged by all. And how can I dare to change the language of the world in its hoary old age? Now, this is 382, right? This hoary old age. Uh, and carry it back to the early days of its infancy. Is there a man, learned or unlearned, who will not, when he takes the volume in his hands and perceives that what he reads does not suit his settled tastes, break out immediately into violent language and call me a forger and a profane person for having had the audacity to add anything to the ancient books or to make any changes or corrections therein? I think this is a sentiment that perpetually exists as translations uh, seek to correct words and get them closer to the original. Um, I thought for sure I had this story. When he translated um, Jonah, remember in Jonah chapter 4, I know I've got that in here. I'm going to wait to tell the story because I know it's in here. If I don't, I'll tell you at the end. Just remember. So um, today we have over 10,000 manuscripts of the Latin Vulgate, but they don't all agree with each other. So Jerome sought to make this correction that was authorized by the, the little C Catholic Church. Okay, when you have Roman Catholic friends and they look at church history, they look at that word Catholic with their eyes of anachronism. They're reading back into history something that was not true at the time. And they see big R, big C, Roman Catholic Church. Okay, Catholic at that time just meant orthodox, Nicene orthodoxy. Jesus is God. Jesus is God and man, right? Both properties of God exist and all the properties of humanity exist and they're united together but not mingled together, right? We saw the kind of the four boundaries that came from the Council of Chalcedon in 451. Um, uh, so these Latin Vulgate translations are, are, are typically categorized as Italian, Spanish, Irish, French. Uh, there's a guy who is a, a scholar named Alcuin and Theodolf, and they have um, categories of Latin Vulgate. Well, in, in 1546, the Roman Catholic Church, as a response to the Protestant Reformation, uh, especially rejecting the books of the Apocrypha, made the Latin Vulgate Bible the official authorized version of Scripture uh, for the Roman Catholic Church. The problem was uh, they didn't know exactly what version that was going to be. It's sort of like the King James Version, right? Like the issue number one, Cambridge and Oxford printed two different Bibles. Which one is the original, right? We don't know, right? They, they, from the beginning, there were two versions. Is it the He Bible or the She Bible, right? Like, which one is it? Uh, and, and other differences between the two printers. Well, they had it a little bit worse off uh, with the Latin Vulgate. In fact, in the 14th century, there was an Italian scholar by the name of Lorenzo Valla who said, you know, all these Latin Vulgates have a lot of differences in them. But Jerome wrote commentaries on the scripture. And I bet Jerome's commentaries were copied less times than his Bible was. So we could look at his commentary and see what he thought the original words were. Probably get back to, you know, the turn of the 5th century, 404, when he was done. And he was absolutely right. And this was what inspired Erasmus, Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, to, to produce his Novum Testamentum Greek, right? That the new Greek translation that after 15 revisions would get labeled, you know, the Textus Receptus as a uh, marketing ad. Well, by 1546, they had a lot of versions of the Latin Vulgate. And so they had to make another revision of it in 1590, 1592, 1590. You get the picture, right? Like it's perpetually being reissued as the official formal version of the Roman Catholic Bible. These were just versions I happen to have found uh, that, that were revisions. I'm sure there's probably more of them. Now, a few words about the Latin Vulgate. 
It is, to Bible translations, what Muhammad Ali is to boxing, or Tom Brady is to football, or Wayne Gretzky is to hockey. It, by, I mean, 1,100 years, this was the translation of the Bible. There is no way to overstate the importance of this translation of the Bible. Up until the 1950s, it was still the language of Scripture that was read in Roman Catholic churches all over the world, regardless of what language you spoke. Okay, it wasn't unique to uh, English or Spanish. Or, everywhere in the world, there was a Roman Catholic church. This was the words that they were reading. I mean, it just unbelievably important translation of Scripture. Um, but it wasn't well received when it first came out. In Jonah 4, 6, um, it, the, the old Latin translation said that when God uh, caused a plant to grow up to give shade to uh, Jonah, it was a gourd. Well, Jerome was living in Bethlehem, speaking and learning Hebrew from Jewish people. They all understood that was a castor oil plant. So when he changed his Latin Vulgate from the Septuagint that said gourd to castor oil plant, they literally had riots in the streets because of castor oil plant instead of gourd. I mean, they, they were very um, zealous about protecting the Latin, uh, of the Latin Vulgate in the Old Testament. Um, so uh, what happens over time is you have emendations, interpolations, and motivated changes that get crept in. So what are those things? Well, an emendation is a, a translator or a copyist who is seeking to improve or correct the text. They might see where uh, Matthew's gospel says something a little bit different than Mark's. And they had already copied Mark's, and so they make Matthew's match Mark's, even though that wasn't what Mark actually wrote. They've emended the text to make them more like the other. Um, or interpolations, additions to the text. In the, the Eastern church, they were fighting with the Arians, right? These people who said Jesus was not actually God. And so they had added things to uh, thoughts to Scripture. 1 John 5, 7 comes to mind. Augustine, in particular, was the first person in church history who said, when you get to uh, the, 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 uh, the water, the blood, and the spirit, and these three agree, it's a commentary by Augustine saying, one cannot help but think of the persons of the Trinity. That would eventually become a whole new verse that was never in any manuscript of the Bible, that John never wrote, that, that is today uh, sometimes found in 1 John, like in the New King James and the King James, even though it's not original. This was an interpolation. It was it's something that was made as a, as a note. And then now you don't know, was it original or not? A thousand years later, right? Like they don't have a million manuscripts and commentaries from church fathers to look back on like we do today. Um, everything was hand copied. They had maybe two or three copies. So, uh, and, and motivated changes. Uh, again, that would be uh, something where they think something is wrong and they try to correct it. So, uh, I already mentioned Jerome's commentaries, Lorenzo Valla determined, hey, there are things that are different. This is eventually what caused Erasmus. But what about the Apocrypha? And again, if you would like more information about this, we did talk about this a whole hour-long series about how we got the Bible. Why do we uh, as Christian Protestants, not accept these additions, but the Roman Catholic Church does. Well, there were two things that Jerome primarily had to deal with as he was making his translation. The first was, as he's copying the Old Testament, should he trust the Greek 250 BC translation of the Old Testament, commonly called the Septuagint, or should he use as his source text the Hebrew Bible that he can now read? He's one of two early church fathers we know could read and understand Hebrew. Jer Jerome and Origen were the two we know of. And this may seem easy today because if you open your Bible to the front, you'll probably see somewhere in the preface a note that the Old Testament comes from something called the BHS, the Biblical Hebraica Stuttgardensia, right? That is the Masoretic text. The Masoretes were a a family of rabbis, Ben Asher and uh, Ben Naphtali, uh, from the uh, 10th century. 
who they were the ones that put the, the, the vowels marking, right? The appointments to it. Their text in Hebrew very, very closely matches the Dead Sea Scrolls that we discovered in the 1940s. But they're not identical to the Septuagint. In some significant places, Psalm 22, they, the, the New Testament quotes Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and my feet. But the Masoretic text says they were lions to my feet. There's no verb even in there. It, literally, they were lions my feet. Right? There's no verb. Well, most of the quotations in the New Testament of the Old Testament come from the Greek translation. And the Hebrews, we saw, the Jewish people wanted Christianity to be identified as its own movement. So there was thought that the Jewish people were translating and copying the Hebrew text in a way that made Jesus look less like the Messiah. They were taking away prophetic statements like Isaiah 7.14, right? The virgin shall conceive, right? The, the, now it, Alma becomes Betula, the young maiden, instead of virgin. But the Septuagint says Parthenos, virgin, right? Were the, were the Hebrews tampering with their text to make Jesus seem less like the Messiah? Could we trust the Hebrew Bible to make a translation of it? This was a serious question in the fourth and fifth century that Jerome had to deal with. Ultimately, Jerome said, you know, in Romans chapter 3, the word of God was given to the Jews. Romans 3, 1 and 2. Uh, so, so he went with that and he said um, that if you translate from Hebrew to Greek and then Greek to Latin, that additional change, that, you know, third step introduces more error than just the incompatibility between Latin and Hebrew. Because you have incompatibility between Latin and Greek and then Greek to Hebrew. So, so he went with um, the Hebrew. And his argument for that is what we today as Protestants look to as um, the proper way of reasoning about how to translate the Old Testament. And what about the apocryphal books? Just a way of reminder, these are the uh, apocryphal books and what we name them in our Protestant Bibles, which before 1815, every Bible had these published. They were after the Old Testament and before the New Testament. So Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, uh, you can see what they are. The Maccabees are like history books. Uh, there were additions to uh, Jeremiah, additions to Esther, additions to Daniel. There's actually three additions to Daniel. And again, I, I talk about those more fully in that class. Um, on bibliology. I think it's week four, if memory serves. Um, well, Jerome, looking at his preface to Kings, he had this to say about these apocryphal books. This preface to the scriptures may serve as a helmeted, a defensive introduction to all the books which we turn from Hebrew into Latin, so that we may be assured that what is outside of them must be placed aside among the apocryphal writings, Wisdom, therefore, which generally bears the name of Solomon, and the book of Jesus, the son of Sirach, and Judith, and Tobias, the shepherd, are not in the canon. The first book of Maccabees is found in Hebrew, but the second is in Greek, as can be proved from its very style. So Jerome recognized that the Jews never accepted these books as canon. Now there is an argument that your Roman Catholic friends will say is that Pope Damasus in a decree from the Council of Rome in 382, declared these books as scriptural and because of the church gave the Bible to the church under the church's authority, we have to accept them today. Again, this is one of the big differences we have between, you know, Roman Catholics is that, the, you know, we, we talk about the five solas of the Reformation. Anybody remember what those were? The first sola fide, Right? By faith alone, sola gracias, right? Through grace alone, solas, solus, Christus, right? Through, by Christ alone, right? Uh, sola scriptura, right? Scripture is the ultimate authority. And then the last sola of the Reformation was sole dea gloria, right? Only for the glory of God, not because of our you know, worth or our, our value, but for God's glory alone. Well, in 382, supposedly there was this council. Remember, that was, uh, us, uh, that was uh, why Jerome 
was called out of the desert in Antioch to Rome in the first place to be Damas' secretary. And so they'll point to this council. The problem is the only reason we know about this council is from a letter called the Galatian Decree that came from the 8th century. 400 years later. This is our historical record of this council. And oddly, there was no church father in that 400 years that ever pointed to this council as having ever even happened, yet alone having any authority. It's like it just wasn't. It's not like, uh, you know, there's, there's literally no historical record until the 15th century when somebody then points to this 8th century letter that points to a 4th century council that was supposed to have happened that declared these books were canonical. So we're very thin ice here, right? We're kind of skeptical. But you add to that, there also is no secular record of any council having happened in Rome at all ever in the 4th century. Yet alone, one in 382, where a pope was supposed to have said, these are the canonical books of the Bible. Like there's literally no historical record in the whole 4th century of any council having ever happened. But we have many, many councils that happen at various minor cities all throughout Rome during this time. So one would think if the Pope, you know, called a council in the fourth century in the former capital of Rome, we might have some record of that. I mean, I I understand this is an argument from silence, right? Saying that there's no record is not asserting it didn't happen, but it's strongly suggestive, along with nobody ever quoted about it for, you know, 400 years, and then nobody ever pointed to it again until the 15th century. And... That 8th century text says that in 382, they quoted from books that were written 30 years later by Augustine. It's very difficult to quote from a book that's going to be written 30 years in the future. Right? Oh, yes. It's appropriate not to ask the question, but what would have, it's very interesting, what would have been the, the Catholic Church's reason for them bringing this, bring this apocryphal book in and saying they're canonical if there's so little to point to that actually is accepted. Yeah, why? The question is what is the motivation of the Roman Catholic Church to include apocryphal books when there's so little evidence? In fact, there's strong evidence they were never accepted. Is that the. Yeah, well. For one, in 2 Maccabees, there is a a story of a woman who's redeeming her children by paying for her children, gathering silver. So uh, if you as a church want to raise money for St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, you're going to sell indulgences and you're going to look to biblical support of this woman redeeming her children by taking a gathering and offering. There's stories of purgatory and punishment after death of purification. So support for some. Absolutely. Yep. So they, they, the only biblical support, and biblical is in quotes, apocryphal biblical support for several Catholic doctrine, Roman Catholic doctrines come from these books. So if they're not in there, there's no biblical support. Um, not that that would matter because they could ju- then just claim, well, we have the, the chair of Peter in Rome. The Pope speaks infallibly from that chair, and this is apostolic tradition, and the church is authoritative uh, over the Bible, right? 382, we gave the Bible to the the people anyhow. It was the Roman Catholic authority, the Pope of Rome's authority to declare what was... All right, so uh, 8th century text shows signs of forgery. It cites books that were written in the 5th century, quotes from Augustine's books written 30 years after, and it it says, hey, these events that happened in the 5th century, it's saying... In its supposed 4th century book, it's declaring those things having have happened. So, um, and the the time period that it came from, that it was discovered, the 8th century, was well known uh, for producing forgeries. Things like the uh, donation of Constantine. Uh, The Vatican City supposedly was donated by Constantine to the Bishop of Rome as his own territory. And there's a, there's a document called the Donation of Constantine that is the authority for it. It's, I mean, universally understood and, and, and proven that this is a forgery. It was not written by Constantine. It never happened, but it was the theological and secular authority for Vatican to be its own nation inside of Italy for centuries. So we, we know there were many forgeries from this time. So 
Historically, this Council of Rome declaring the books of canon um, does not hold any water. Um, so, uh, okay. So what can we learn by Jerome and, and Ambrose? Uh, well, first, there are appropriate spheres that God has designated for the church to operate in. We are not the government. We don't, uh, you know, make the, the, the laws. What we do is we change hearts through the spreading of the gospel and let people who are Christians act as, you know, people of the state. Uh, we should not uh, be intervening uh, in the way that Ambrose did uh, over the affairs of state. Um, when we look around today and we see the zeal and the vigor over what's right and wrong and the passion over that, understand we are walking in a tradition. Uh, there's a huge history, goes way back and oftentimes is far more uh, violent. We saw it, uh, you know, the, the, before the Council of um, 451, uh, was the second Ephesus where uh, Flavian, the bishop of Constantinople, was beat to death at the council by um, uh, Dio, uh, Dioscorus's thugs from Egypt, right? Like we don't generally have church leaders being beat to death at church conferences today, generally. I mean, at least not in the U.S. I can't attest around the world. Uh, but this, this zeal and this vigor um, is, is definitely uh, not unique. But that is not the Spirit of God. Right? The Spirit of God is, is not one of this, this violent, when the Lord comes back, he will rule with a rod of iron. Right? We, we don't have to do his work. He, he's going to do a good job. Right? People living in sin are already under the condemnation of God. Uh, we're not going to do a better job than God has already promised to do. Right? We saw that when we, we looked at the psalm last week, Psalm 21. Uh, we saw that the, we can learn from this the way that God preserved his word in the New Testament was very different than what he did in the Old Testament. He preserved his word in the New Testament through a, a wide number of uh, copies and translations that we can clearly see um, the fingerprints of God working in history. It is extremely valuable to have a translation of God's word that everybody can read. And they understood that. That's why they put it in Latin. That was the language of the people. And one thing I didn't mention is that in North Africa, um, they primarily only had the Bible in Greek or Latin, which was not the native tongue of the North Africans. So when uh, the 600s come by and the, the Islamic revolt happened, people readily gave up Christianity because they didn't have the Bible in their native tongue. Now, scholars will debate to this day, but the historical record shows that where people had, you know, the Latin Vulgate is not far from French, Italian, Portuguese, right, Spanish, right? They're, they're all Romance languages, Latin-based languages, so they, they readily translated Scripture into the native tongues as those languages developed. Uh, they did not give up to the Islamic revolution, having had, you know, the word of God in their native tongue. So, and then the other thing is the importance, especially for Jerome, of evaluating uh, sources and records with the, you know, supposed council of, of Rome in 382. Uh, just because it is said does not make it true. Uh, you know, we, we have to be careful at identifying who is the speaker, what are their sources, what are their qualifications, what is their motivation for, you know, including or excluding something? Uh, those all have to play a factor in our, our decision uh, as far as their understanding. So I think those are five things we can learn from them. Next week, we're going to be looking probably the next two weeks uh, at Augustine. Um, easy to say the most influential uh, person in Western theological tradition. He's really not that important in the Eastern side of the church, but you know we we walk this Western path. So we'll look at Augustine, and then we'll probably have to take a peek back at the Eastern church and see the shenanigans going on there in church history uh, for a week after we look at him. Any other questions? I love questions. I don't want to, you know, not have questions. Yes. <laughs> 
Athanasian Creed? They are similar. So the Nicene Creed we already looked at is actually the Niceno-Constantinopolian Creed. And that was, the, the purpose of creeds is not to define um, belief, it's to set boundaries. You can't say something about God that is outside of this boundary. Um, it's not to supersede what scripture says. It was written to uh, protect or defend against heresies that had happened. Nicaea was the divinity of God. Constantinople, they reaffirmed that and added to it the statements about the Holy Spirit from, from Scripture. What does the Holy Spirit do? That's what those statements are. The apostolic creed um, goes back into history uh, supposedly to what the apostles had said about Christianity. Um, if you ever hear uh, that Jesus descended into hell for three days, that comes from the apostolic creed. It doesn't come from scripture. I mean, there's inferences you can make in scripture that would say that, um, but I wouldn't say they were good inferences. In fact, I would say they're probably wrong inferences. Topic for a different day. Um, but it is a traditional historic creed of the church. So um, churches, and, and then the Athanasius was the um, eventual bishop of Alexandria. He also uh, was a orthodox, zealous to protect the understanding that Jesus was divine. So he uh, is credited with this Athanasian creed that serves to function in the same way the Niceno-Constantinopolian creed serves. So churches that look at those and, and set those is sort of like a statement of faith uh, that they might have. And, and there's a long historical uh, record for them. I don't think that answers your question, but that's just what I know of them. I, I can't speak to why that church would have them, you know, publicly displayed or um, value them. Any other questions? Jonah story? Yeah, so Jonah was the castor oil plant. Uh, he translated it instead of gourd. Gourd was the Septuagint. And when they read that publicly, it caused riots in the streets. You may be familiar with the, the 1950s. There was a translation of the Bible uh, called the Revised Standard Version that, that garnered the ire of many fundamental preachers because in Isaiah 7, 14, they said young maiden or young woman, which is a good translation of the Hebrew, but people saw it as an attack on the virgin birth of Christ, even though the New Testament is extremely clear. Jesus was born of a virgin. You don't need Isaiah 7, 14 for that. Um, in fact, I think if you don't understand Isaiah in its context, you miss the impact that Joseph had when he heard this prophecy being spoke to him by the angel. And, and the difference in greatness of that prophecy. Well, anyhow, the Revised Standard Version was burned publicly in pulpits by pastors, much like the riots in the streets from Jerome's translation of Jonah, right? It, it's, a, it's not new to history is what, what I want to kind of get that point across, that that zeal that people have appropriately for God's word can be expressed in inappropriate ways, uh, you know, that go beyond uh, what the Spirit would call us to do. So that's my Jonah story. Uh, yeah, castor oil plant. Better translation than gourd. All right, well, thank you for those of you who joined us online and those of you who joined us in person. Looking forward to hearing uh, service this morning as uh, Eric Simpson is preaching. <laughs>